Time for us to do some practice involving integration by parts, which is going to be a fantastic part of our collection of integration tools. It's a new idea which involves saying, hey, maybe if we have a product where if we integrate one part and differentiate the other part, our integral becomes simpler. Of course, it's not so obvious how to do it. And as always, practice is important. So you do practice, and the more practice you get, the easier it becomes to say, ah, I see this. I know when to use my tool. And so do as much as you can. If you're following along with the video, make use of the pause button. See a problem? Try it out yourself first. And then if you do need help, you can unpause me. But after a while, you'll see, hey, Steve, I don't need you so much anymore. That's okay. No problem. I'm so glad that you're making great progress on your own. But for now, let's begin. Our first problem. So we have this region R. It's actually shown down here. It's in our first quadrant bounded by the axes, the coordinate axes, the curve y equals e to the x, and the line x equals log 2. And the question, find the volume generated when r is rotated around the line x equals log 2. Okay, so we have to think about, all right, what are we looking for? Well, we see the word volume. So we're probably doing a volume problem. And whenever I'm doing a volume problem, I like to think about, okay, break things into small pieces, find what's happening with each piece, and add them all together. Now, everything so far seems to be hinting we should be integrating with respect to x. We have y as a function of x, our bounds x goes between 0 and log 2, which means I can think of a small slice. So for integrating with respect to x, we have a small dx, and we're spinning here around this line log 2. So if we spin, we look at what shape we form, and we say, aha, this is forming a little tiny can or cylinder or a shell. So this is a shell method problem for volumes. All right, great. So we say, how does the shell method work? Well, the way it works is you add up from your start to your finish because that's how integration always works. It's adding things up. Then we have a 2 pi, and then we have a radius, a height, and a thickness. And the thickness is actually pretty straightforward. It's what we're integrating with respect to. That's dx. The bounds are pretty straightforward, because we can see we're going from 0 to log 2. No problem. So 0, and this is log 2. The height, well, that's e to the x. Okay, because it's from 0 up to e to the x. The radius, okay. This is the part we have to think about. Now, what is the radius? The radius is how far we are from where we're spinning. So, in other words, that's the radius we're referring to. The distance from this log 2 to where we're currently at. So if we think of where we're currently at as being x, then we say, OK, if I want to find the radius, it's the high value minus the low value. So it's right minus left, high minus low. So it would be log of 2 minus x. All right. So what do we have? So let's just rewrite it. 0 to log of 2 of log 2 minus x e to the x dx. All right. Great. Cool. Except I forgot to write down the 2 pi. All right. Now we're really great. OK, cool. So we have all our pieces in place. All right. Well, now we have to turn to integrate. So the, the volume formula was helping us set up. And so far, it hasn't felt very partsy yet. But now we say, ah, hmm, uh, how do we integrate this? Well, we see we have two things multiplying. So that's a strong candidate for parts. But it's not just that it's two things multiplying. 
Let's say we say, oh, look, e to the x, you can integrate or differentiate that. It's always going to be e to the x. Here you have a polynomial. Now, it may not look like a polynomial because of the log 2, but that's because log 2 looks like a strange number. But remember, it is a number. So it's some number minus x. So we say, aha, mm -hmm. this is a nice situation. Well, if we were to differentiate this, things would get better. So let's make this the part that we differentiate, which means that this other part is the part that we integrate. So the derivative of natural log of 2 minus x would be negative 1. The integral of e to the x, well, no surprise, e to the x. So what do we have? Well, don't forget about the 2 pi. So we have our 2 pi, then we have uv. So log 2 minus x e to the x. And then we need to evaluate that between 0 and natural log 2. And so we'll go back and evaluate that in a second. Because it's a definite integral, so we have to do our evaluation. Minus and then we have v du. But don't forget there's also a 2 pi. So there's a integral, 0 to log 2, the 2 pi, and there's a minus 1, and e to the x, dx. We probably should have written down that du is actually minus 1 dx. There we go, just for full reference. Okay, well, the great news is that's now pretty straightforward to integrate. So we have that this is 2 pi log 2 minus x e to the x from 0 to log 2, which we'll clean that up in a second. The 2 pi can come out, the minus can come out, so that becomes plus 2 pi e to the x and 0 to log 2. Okay, so plug it in. When you plug in log of 2, log of 2 minus log of 2 is 0. Goes away. Great. Plug in 0. Okay, so we have 0 from log 2. Subtract. Well, when you plug in 0, we have 2 pi times log of 2 times e to the 0. Okay, well, that's 2 pi log 2. All right, now come over to here. Plug in. Plug in log 2. 2 pi e to the log of 2. Well, that'll be plus 2 pi times 2, which is 4 pi. Then subtract 2 pi e to the 0. So that's 2 pi. And there we go. Okay, so we can clean that up. So this becomes, <coughs> excuse me, this becomes... 2 pi, as we can pull out, there's a 2 pi there, also 2 pi there, so you can factor that out. 2 pi, 1 minus natural log of 2. And we're done. That's it. That's the whole thing. And uh, so there you go. So it's nice. This shows you, that says, look, integration by parts, yes, it's, it's a tool to use in theory, but it's going to show up in practice because there are times when we want to involve something which has a factor of x times another function, for example. It's not the only case. There's going to be other cases where we see integration by parts showing up. So, good. Well, let's try some more problems, right? Of course. Of course. So, our next problem. A special vat, which is basically just a holder, holds some kind of liquid, uh, has been formed by taking the curve x equals secant y for 0 less than or equal to y, less than or equal to pi fourths, and spinning it around the y-axis. And here are all lengths measured in feet. Okay, currently the vat is completely full of a fluid with density 100 pounds. Per cubic foot. Find the amount of work to empty the vat of the fluid 
if the fluid must be raised to the brim of the vat. Okay, so let's see if we can understand what's going on here. So what is going on? Well, you have x equals secant y. So if you think about secant y, you know, it kind of looks like this. So when we do x equals secant y, it's going to turn it sideways. So in particular, x equals secant y would look something along the lines of the following. If we're only talking about for y from 0 to pi force, it would start here at 1 and sort of come up. Okay, so here, this is pi force. And of course, the secant function continues. It actually goes and approaches an asymptote at pi over 2, but we don't need to know that information. Now, what's going to happen is we're going to take that curve and we're going to spin it. And as we spin it, we're going to see a nice shape emerge. And so we're going to end up with some sort of a that with sort of a looks like that. So there's there's our vat. Well, not the best picture, but but we get a rough idea. Okay, so this is currently full of some kind of liquid. All right, and it's uh, it's kind of dense, has a hundred pounds per cubic foot. And so what do we want? Well, we want to take this liquid here, and we want to think about pumping it out. So the way we do it is we think about taking a small little sliver and moving it to the top. So we have the basic following formula. And oftentimes when we set problems up, if we just remember what the formula is, we're like two thirds, 75% of the way there. So what's our formula for work? Especially when we're talking about work about pumping or emptying. Well, you're adding up the little bit. So I'm adding up how much work do I have to do to get that little piece out? So start to stop. And then we're going to have a distance because work is a force times a distance. So there's a distance. The other pieces give us the force. There's the density. There's the area. And there's the thickness. And what's happening is we're going to say area, it's the area of a cross section. Area times thickness is the volume of a little piece. Volume times density is the weight of a little piece. So the force, force times distance is the work to move that piece and add up all the little bits of work and you get the total work. Okay, so that's the derivation. Okay, well, we now just have to start filling in our pieces. Okay, so let's think about our pieces. What do we have? Well, let's start with our bounds. Well, we can see our bounds. It's uh, 0 to pi over 4. See, because we're told, completely full. All right, so 0 to pi over 4. Our distance. So the distance, we're thinking about going from currently we're at level y. We want to go to the brim, right? Because it says you have to be raised to the brim of the vat. The brim is at pi over 4. So our distance is from our current height y to a height of pi over 4. So you, you take the difference to find that. And pi over 4 is the higher value. So it would be pi over 4 minus y. The density is 100. Okay. The area, well, now, what do we see? When we spin, we get a circle. So it's going to be pi something. Okay, so now here's where we have to think about it. What is our something? Well, our radius is out to the curve. And this curve is the curve x equals secant y. So the distance from the center of where we spin to our curve is secant y. So that's our radius. So pi radius squared would be pi secant squared y. Our thickness is dy. All right, great, wonderful. 
So we can move some constants out, 100 pi, that we can easily move out, and it grows 0 to pi over 4, and then we have pi over 4 minus y times secant squared y dy. Okay, so we set it up, and now we have to actually integrate. I mean, how do we actually solve the problem? That's a good question. Well, so we think to ourselves, okay, we have two things multiplying together, a pi over 4 minus y and a secant squared y. It looks to be a pretty good candidate for integration by parts. Certainly because it's integration by parts is, is our practice session. Yeah, of course, we're like integration by parts. But not just that. It's because, well, they're not really compatible. You know, it's not like, oh, I have a substitution I can make or, oh, there's a trig identity because you have something polynomial and something trigonometric. It's not going to mix too well. But we do have a polynomial, and it's kind of a really nice polynomial in that when we take a derivative, we're going to get to a constant. Ah, oh, the best kind of polynomial. Mwah! Beautiful, beautiful. So we say to ourselves, okay, this would be something we'd like to take a derivative of. So we'll call this our u. Now, what do we have? Well, we'd have... If that's where we take the root of, this part is the part we integrate. And so we say, ah, oh, all right. Well, hmm, does secant squared have a nice integral? And the answer is yes. Ah, oh, we are in luck. It turns out the integral of secant squared, it's one of the 10 integrals that we should know. So the integral of secant squared is tangent. What wonderful, wonderful. And, of course, the derivative of pi force minus y would be minus dy. So, great. Well, we're in business. So, we can proceed. What do we have? We have the 100 pi in front. Okay, we won't forget that. Of course not. We need that. What else do we have? Well, we're going to have uv. Pi force minus y times tangent of y and we're going to evaluate from 0 to pi over 4 whatever that turns out to be we'll figure that out uh, very soon then minus don't forget the 100 pi so I'm going to write the 100 pi here then it's the integral of 0 to pi over 4 v du so that will be minus, minus tangent y dy. Okay, good, 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 good. Now, let's uh, do a little bit of cleaning up. And uh, first off, we see two negatives. That makes a positive. That's good. We'd like to have a positive number. Let's come back to here. and Let's see what happens. When you plug in pi over 4, pi over 4 minus pi over 4, is 0. So that says when you plug in pi over 4, you get 0. Let's plug in 0. When you plug in 0, tangent of 0 is 0. So what happens? That says this part is 0. It goes away completely. Gone. Gone, gone, gone. Wow. Wow. That was almost too good. Well, I don't know if anything's ever too good, which means we have this one part left, the integral of tangent. Do we know it? Yes, because it's on our list. We know the integral of tangent. So the integral of tangent is natural log of secant. So natural log secant of y. And we're going to go from 0 to pi over 4. Now, let's start by plugging in 0. Because oftentimes when you plug in 0, nice things happen. Secant of 0 is 1. Log of 1 is 0. Goes away. So we just have to plug in pi over 4. Secant of pi over 4 is square root of 2. So we end up with 100 pi natural log of square root of 2. And if we wanted units, 
uh, we can see we have feet and pounds, so it would be 100 pi log 2 foot pounds. And that would be it. That's it. That's our answer. Wow, cool. It worked out pretty well, actually. Not too bad at all. Not too bad at all. It's just a matter of setting it up and then carrying out the computations. All right, good. Well, let's continue on. Another problem. In the first quadrant, find the area of the region inside r equals 2 theta times the root of cosine theta, shown below. And so we were looking at this and saying, wait, what? Well, we actually have some hints here, right? Because we see r and we see theta. So when you see r and theta together, you say, aha, this is a, a polar curve. And we can even see what's happening here. It's coming out and looping and coming back. Well, notice at this angle, theta equals zero, well, you'd have r equals zero because theta equals zero. At this angle, which is pi halves, well, cosine of pi halves is zero. So that's when we come back in. See, we're going to exit at zero because of the theta we're going to come back at pi halves because of the cosine so how do we find area in polar the way we find area is area is adding up and it's our little wedges of pi's right we go think of going out so it's one half the distance squared so we think of this as radius squared d theta. So this right here, this one half radius squared d theta, it's like finding the area inside a little pi wedge. So for us, what do we have? It's integral zero to pi over two of one half of, we square that, two, oh, whoops, I forgot to put the square here, two theta root cosine theta squared d theta. So, if we write that down, 0 to pi halves, uh, 2 squared is 4 times a half, 2, so 2 theta squared times cosine theta. Good. All right, so that's all we have to do. How bad could that be? Well, okay, let's think about what we can do. Uh, now, we see cosine, we, we see theta squared. Cosine is one of those things where it doesn't really matter whether we integrate or differentiate. Theta squared, aha, if we differentiate, it becomes simpler. So, going off the principle, we want to make something simpler. We say, okay, let's do the case where we set the first part, this part here, we'll call that our u, and then the rest of it, is our dv. All right, well, great. So what happens next? Well, what happens next is we have to take our various pieces. du, derivative here, 4 theta d theta. And then integral of cosine is sine. So this becomes uv. So 2 theta squared sine theta from 0 to pi over 2. Whatever that turns out to be, we'll deal with that in a few minutes. Then we're going to have minus the integral v du. So that'll be minus 0 to pi over 2, 4 theta sine theta d theta. All right, well, we've definitely made it simpler which means we're on the right track. But we're not done yet. we got to keep going and making it even simpler, right? Because we're not to the point where we say, aha, and this I can integrate. But we say, look, probably just keep going. And we always say, once you commit, you got to stay consistent. So that says the fourth theta, that's the part we're going to, 
differentiate and the sign, that'll be the part that we're going to integrate. So our du is 4 d theta, and our v, well, integral of sine is minus cosine. Okay, so what do we have? We have our 2 theta squared sine of theta from 0 to pi over 2, which we'll go through and evaluate that shortly, minus, and to make sure I don't lose anything, parentheses. Parentheses are a great way to make sure we don't forget a sign. Because it happens a lot more than you might think. And you always feel like, oh, I forgot a sign. Gah! So we want to make sure we don't have that, that, that ah, feeling. Okay, uv minus 4 theta cosine theta. uv minus, oh, whoops, and don't forget, this is an evaluation, 0 to the power 2, minus v du. So the integral, 0 to pi over 2, and that'll be a minus 4 cosine theta d theta. Okay, good, good. Well, we've definitely, uh, are almost there. In fact, we can clean things up. We see, for instance, uh, we have the following, a minus, a minus, make a plus. A classic, of course, two wrongs make a right. Well, maybe not, but of course, two negatives combined together do make a positive. And uh, let's keep going. Okay, so let's uh, clean this up. What do we have? Well, well, we'll move up over to here. So we still have our... 2 theta squared sine of theta, which we're going to evaluate from 0 to pi over 2. Don't forget about this minus. It's going to distribute through to both terms. Minus minus makes a plus 4 theta cosine theta from 0 to pi over 2. And here we have a, a minus, and the integral of cosine is sine. So minus 4 sine theta from 0 to pi over 2. Okay, so those are all of our pieces. And the last thing for do to do is uh, to plug it in. Now, the good news is when we plug in 0, in the first term, we're going to get 0 because we have a 0 squared. In the second term, we're going to get a 0 because of the theta. And the last term, we'll get 0 because of sine of theta. So we really just have to plug in pi over 2. So, when we plug in pi over 2, sine of pi over 2 is 1. So you have 2 times pi over 2 squared. So 2 pi over 2 squared. When we plug pi over 2 into here, well, cosine of pi over 2 is 0. It goes away. Gone. Mwah. Beautiful. Uh, now, for the last term, sine of pi over 2 is 1. So what do we end up with? We end up with minus 4. So we end up with pi squared, then the 2 divided by 4, so that's pi squared over 2, subtract 4. And we're done. We're done. So that says the area of this little thing is pi squared over 2 minus 4. Ah, nice answer. Nice, nice answer. And it's not too surprising that we see things such as integration by parts showing up here because we see that sort of combination of, of algebra together with trig. Whenever we see that, we're like, well, there's probably going to be some integration by parts to sort of knock down that algebra until it goes away. Okay, good. Well, let's uh, try another problem. So, find the integral of theta cubed sine of theta d theta. Now, I'm going to pause here. There are some people who learn how to do integration by parts using a, a sort of a tabular method where they say, okay, well, I'm going to have like two columns where in one column I'm going to talk about, I keep taking derivatives, another column I keep taking integrals, 
and then I just make sure I combine things in the right way and it should all work out because it will all work out. So if you're comfortable with that and you do it correctly, that's okay. I, I'm not here to say you must do things this way, you must not do things that way. I, I was not raised with that. So I, I do things sort of slow and pedantically and just as long as you get the right answers, I'm, I'm okay with whatever you do. The key, of course, is get the right answers. If you're getting the wrong answers, you should not be doing it. So here, it's kind of looking at this problem. We see, look, we can see sine, if you integrate or differentiate, it becomes like cosine, and it's gonna sort of go between sine, cosine, sine, cosine. Okay, doesn't really matter. The theta cubed, if you integrate, ah, uh, higher and higher, terrible, terrible. Differentiate, lower and lower, ah, uh, beautiful, beautiful. So I say, okay, so what we can see is we should make the theta cubed be the part we're gonna differentiate the sine theta d theta, that'll be the part that we integrate. And we can kind of see, oh, we're gonna to have to do this several times because each time we apply it, we're gonna knock down the power in that theta by one. So we're having a theta cubed, it's gonna to go to theta squared, it's gonna to go to theta, and it's gonna to go to one, and we'll be done. So we should probably do integration by parts, I think three times now. So we'll get pretty good at this. Okay. So, at least I hope we're going to get really good at it. What do we have? Our du, 3 theta squared d theta. Our v, integral of sine, is negative cosine. So, first round, round number one. We're going to have uv minus theta cubed cosine theta. It's an indefinite integral, we don't need bounds. That's nice. Okay, and then minus the integral of v du. So we're gonna have a three theta squared and a minus a cosine theta d theta. Let's go ahead and just take advantage of that minus sign. So in other words, we're gonna make that minus sign we're gonna pull out. So we have a plus, ah, good. The nice thing about a plus is you don't have to worry about distributing a plus sign. It's the minus sign you have to worry about. Okay, so we're ready for round two. We have simplifiers. So we've, we're feeling pretty good right now. We said we started with a theta cubed, we're down to a theta squared. Life is good. Life is wonderful. So for round two, we keep consistent. The, the, what we identified as our u before continues to be our u. What we identified as our dv before continues to be our dv. So in particular, the 3 theta squared, that'll become our u. The cosine theta d theta will become our dv. du will be 6 theta d theta. And v, the integral of cosine, is positive sine. So we have the first term still comes along, minus theta cubed cosine theta. Then we're going to get uv. So plus 3 theta squared sine of theta minus the integral of v du. So we'll write that as 6 theta sine theta d theta. All right, good. So we did it once. We've done it twice, and we've, again, we're making good progress. We've got theta sine theta, so it's like, okay, good, good. We're on the right trail. So, but we still need to push it a little bit further. So I'm going to repeat again, same consistency. So the six theta, six theta, well, that's kind of hard to say, isn't it? That's going to be our u. The sine theta d theta is our dv. And just to help remind ourselves, I'm going to put parentheses here. I didn't really need it in the previous step because we made it into a plus. We took advantage of our sign uh, change, that, that extra minus sign. So we're not having that for this round, so we're going to be a little bit more careful. DU, well, good news is it's essentially 6 
So the theta goes away. How about V? Well, the integral of sine, no surprise, we did it a little bit ago, negative cosine. So we have that first term still there, so minus theta cubed, cosine theta. The second term still there, minus three, sorry, plus three theta squared sine theta minus parenthesis uv. So that's minus six theta cosine theta minus the integral of v du. So that'll be six times minus cosine theta d theta. Okay, all right. Now let's be careful. The right amount of careful, yes? Okay, so the two minuses here become a plus. The integral of six times cosine, this become six times sine of theta. And then we'll just tack on a plus C on the end because we'll be done. And make sure your minus distributes through. So minus theta cubed cosine theta plus three theta squared sine of theta minus minus plus six theta cosine theta. That minus minus six sine theta and of all, of course, as always, because it's an indefinite integral, plus C. And that's it. Done. Done. It's not so bad. It's just a matter of be careful, be methodical, one layer at a time. It's definitely an onion-type problem where there's many layers and maybe a couple tiers involved. But we'll just keep working them. All right, good. Well, on to... More problems. Our next problem. Here we go. Find the integral of theta sine theta and all of that squared. d theta. Ah, oh, hmm. Okay, so we have to think about this. What can we do? Well, first off, let's just rewrite this. Oftentimes, they don't give it to us in necessarily the best way to proceed. They give it to us in a way to write it, but there might be a better way to write it. So this is the same as theta squared sine squared of theta, d theta. And now we say, okay, we've we've been playing this game for a while. We kind of know how it's going. Yeah, we, we know how it's going, right? We say, look, the theta squared, that's the part where we take derivatives. The sine squared, that's the part where we integrate and life is good except for the one small detail. How do you integrate sine squared? It's not actually so easy, is it? So what do we do? Well, the answer is we, we don't integrate sine squared. What we do is we say, hey, let's reach into our bag of trig identities and aha, there's a trig identity that works. And you're saying, well, of course there's a trig identity that works. There's always a trig identity whenever there's trig functions involved. But the question is, which trig identity do we need? If you look at this, you say, you know, the thing that's making this challenging is the fact that you have the sine squared. And if it was just theta squared sine theta, life is good, no problem. So how do we correct that? So we want to somehow reduce that degree, or if you like, reduce the power. So what we're looking for is some sort of power reducing identity. Well, it turns out there's a nice identity that does just that. And that is the following. Sine squared of something, sine squared, let's say x, is equal to 1 half times 1 minus cosine of 2x. So we can replace a, a sine squared with something which doesn't have any square at all, which is fantastic. All right, so we say, okay, good. Let's update our function. So we haven't done any integration by parts. What we're working on is the idea of saying, let's use things such as trigonometry to help simplify what it is we're trying to integrate. So it becomes theta squared times a half 
times 1 minus cosine of 2 theta, because in this case, x is theta. And we can expand this. So for instance, we can say this is the integral of 1 half theta squared. And I can just do that as its own integral, d theta, and then minus, because of the minus, the integral 1 half theta squared cosine 2 theta d theta. All right, so that's what we've gone down to. Now the first integral, that's no problem. We can handle that. So it's the second integral where we're like, okay, now are we ready to go? Well, now we're into a more comfortable situation because we just have a cosine to a, the one instead of like a sine to the two. So we're able to integrate or differentiate at will of just we might need to have some extra factors of two floating around. So we say, all right, great. Well, we'll proceed. We'll let this polynomial part be the u. This will be our dv. So when we look at our du, what do we have? Well, the integral of a half theta squared is theta d theta. How about for v? Well, the integral of cosine 2 theta is sine of 2 theta, but you have to account for that 2 on the inside, so it becomes 1 half sine 2 theta. Okay, so what do we have? What's next? Well, we integrate the first term, integral of a half theta squared, gives us 1 over 6 theta cubed. Why 1, 6? Because you have a half, and when you integrate theta squared, it's theta cubed divided by 3. Minus, and because I'm doing integration by parts, I'm going to be careful, I'm going to use parentheses, so I don't lose any signs. u times v. So a half theta squared, a half sine 2 theta, 1 fourth theta squared sine of 2 theta. Okay, so that's our uv minus the integral of v du. So that's 1 half theta sine 2 theta d theta. Okay, so let me distribute the minus through. 1 6 theta cubed minus 1 4 theta squared sine of 2 theta. And of course, this minus comes through to there plus integral 1 half theta sine 2 theta d theta. Great. We're making wonderful progress. See, we've reduced it. It was a theta squared. Now it's a theta. Ha ha! Progress. Well, of course, what do we want? More progress. And when do we want it? Well, eventually. Well, let's do it right now. So we keep going. Consistency in how we assign the pieces. So we're going to have du is a half d theta. All right, that's not so bad. Integral of sine, well, is negative cosine. But don't forget, you have to account for the fact that there's a 2 on the inside of your function. So there's going to be an extra factor of a half in front. So what do we have? Well, we have the following. We still have the 1 6 theta cubed minus 1 fourth theta squared sine of 2 theta. So that's a plus, so that's good news for us. u times v, a half theta times minus a half cosine 2 theta makes minus 1 fourth theta cosine. 2 theta. Okay, that's u times v. And then we're going to have minus the integral of v times du. So there's a half, and there's a minus a half, and there's another minus. So when you put them all together, well, we'll just write minus a fourth for right now. And we'll put the minuses together in a second here. And cosine 2 theta d theta. 
And now, of course, we'll clean that up. And we see, aha, the minus and the minus. That's great. And we're ready to write down our final answer. So we end up with 1 over 6 theta cubed minus 1 over 4 and theta squared sine of 2 theta minus 1 over 4 theta cosine of 2 theta. And finally, the integral of cosine 2 theta, we actually did it up here. It's a half sine 2 theta. Don't forget, there's a fourth. There's another half. So that'll make up plus 1 over 8 sine of 2 theta, and of course, plus C. And we're done. That's it. Aha! Good. Good. So again, it's a very similar process to the other ones, but we're just sort of introducing small ideas that are like, okay, how do we adapt to some unusual situations? So in this case, the small idea was, oh, hey, how do we handle ingrained sine squared? Oh, there's some sort of various trig identities we can do, which allows us to simplify. There's a couple ways we could have gone about it, but I think this is about as reasonable as we could have hoped for. All right, well, let's try another problem. Okay, our next problem. Find the integral of cosine of log of t. Okay. Interesting, interesting. Now there's two ways to do this problem. And I, I wanna mention one of them at the beginning and uh, say that we're not going to pursue it. Uh, and then I'll, I'll go another way. So here's one way you could do it. You could say, well, this looks messy because it is. And so how about we do the following? Let's just do a straight up substitution. u equals log of t, because we see that there's a function on the inside. And uh, say, okay, I mean, well, you can try it. What happens? Well, if we do that, we end up with taking the derivative, du would be one over t dt. And, uh, or another way to say this is dt is t du. Okay, well, that's certainly true. And uh, there's only a small catch. You really want to replace dt by something which only involves u. That t should not be there. And that's the problem. But there's a solution. We know that u is the natural log of t, which says that t is the same as e to the u. So this becomes e to the u du. So if you make the substitution, what do you get? You get the integral of cosine of u e to the u du. And now you start going and you do integration by parts. We actually did a, a problem like this in another another practice session. And, uh, and spoiler alert, what you end up doing is you do integration by parts twice, you rearrange and you find the answer. And then you substitute back in and life is good. We're not gonna do it that way. But, and again, it's another spoiler, ah, oh, but still stick around, even though I'm, I'm ruining the big surprises. We will end up doing integration by parts and rearranging and, and getting our answer. Um, the reason is that secretly working this problem is the same as working that problem, but we're gonna just choose to do it in a slightly different way because it's fun to try things in slightly different ways. Okay, so that's the way we're not going to do it. Okay, so how are we gonna do it? Ah, great question, I'm glad you asked. So the way we're going to do it is to say, well, I have no idea how to integrate this. But the good news is, is I'm really wonderful at differentiation. And so if I ever have something and I say, I have no idea how to integrate it, but I'm really wonderful at differentiation, that becomes a signal. Let's try integration by parts. Because integration by parts says, well, you can actually 
kind of make a little bit of progress if you're able to differentiate. But this is one of those things that says, where's the other part? Okay, so for that, here's what we do. We say, look, this integral, you can really think of it in the following way. It's the integral cosine log t times 1 dt. So, this first part is the u, and this will be our dv. So, now we proceed. What's our derivative? Well, chain rule, derivative of cosine, negative sine of log t times root of the inside, 1 over t dt. It's a pretty big derivative. Okay, antiderivative of, of 1. Well, the good news is, that's pretty straightforward. That would be t. So, according to the, the rule for integration by parts, this will become the following. We're going to have u times v. Oh, that's not so bad. t cosine log t. Then we're going to subtract the integral v du. Now, notice here what's going to happen. We're going to have a t and a 1 over t. They're going to cancel. So, what ends up happening is we have a, a minus sign from this minus sine of log t dt. All right, so that's where we're at. Okay, cool. Well, let's clean it up. So there's a, a two minuses, which we can do a plus, and the dt. Well, see how it looks so much like what we had before? We had cosine of log t, now we have sine of log t. So we're really going to think this as a 1 dt. So we say, okay, cool. Well, integration by parts is a technique so nice, let's do it twice. So similar as before, we're going to have the first part be u, the second part be our dv. So we're going to get du is derivative of sine positive cosine log t times 1 over t dt, and v will be t. All right, good. So what do we have? We have the t cosine log t. That's still there. This is still a plus, so now we just have to add u v, so plus t sine of log t, all right, minus the integral of v du. Well, again, the t's cancel, almost like it was meant to be, because it was meant to be. So the t's cancel, so we end up with minus cosine of log t dt. Great. And now we're like, okay, are we going to keep going? No, we're not going to keep going. Because this is our moment we say, wait a second, we've seen this before. See, that's the integral of cosine log of t, which is the same thing as what we have there, integral of cosine log of t. But they're not exactly the same, right? So this is a plus, this is a minus, which means that they don't cancel, they combine. And so we're going to do a little bit of rearranging. So we're going to move this across. So if we move this to the other side, we're going to get the following. 2 times the integral cosine log t dt is equal to t cosine log t plus t sine of log t. And do you need anything else? Plus a constant. Don't forget. Now, if you're wondering, wait, where did this constant miraculously appear from? And first off, we know that when we do an integration problem, we do need a constant. So we know we have to end up with one. But there has to be a reason it's there. We don't just put stuff in because, well, the answer demands it be there. Um, the reason that we need a constant is these are 
antiderivatives of the same function, but that doesn't mean the two antiderivatives have to be exactly the same. They could be off by a plus a constant. So that is, when we put those together, we said, well, actually, there could be an extra constant floating around. So that's where the plus c came from. Okay, last thing, of course, we didn't want to find two times that integral. We just wanted the integral. So now divide by two, and we come to the nice conclusion that the integral of cosine log t dt is one half t cosine log t plus one half t sine of log t plus c. And if you're worried about why did not why did the c not get a factor of a half, c is a constant, it can absorb other constants. So if you have an arbitrary constant and you multiply it by a number, it's still an arbitrary constant. If you have an arbitrary constant and you add a number to it, it's still an arbitrary constant. So we're great. We're good to go. That's our answer. And what a lovely answer it turned out to be. But as we mentioned at the beginning, it's mirroring this process that would happen if we had done the substitution. So if you had done the substitution, it really would not have been really any more or less work. It may have been a little bit nicer notationally, depending upon how you feel about writing things like cosine of log of t. But other than that, the ideas are the same. Do it twice. Say, aha, I'm back to something that looks like what I started with, but not exactly. And that's good. So if it was exactly what you started with, either mistakes were made or you missed something that could have been simpler. We don't want either of those. Definitely don't want mistakes. Uh, but because we were able to rearrange it, we were able to say, aha, we can get our answer, and life is good. Life is wonderful. All right, well, I think we have time for one more, one more problem. So, a nice cool down. Find the integral of cosine cubed x times sine of sine of x dx. Wow, this is going to be fun. Ha. <laughs> okay. Uh huh. Hmm. Huh. How do we do this problem? Well, let's kind of start to think about it. Uh sine of sine of x does not look very appealing and I I'm not super excited about integrating cosine cubed of x not yet. We'll get better at that, by the way. We're going to get really good at integrating things like cosine cubed of x. But remember, we don't always jump to integration by parts. We start saying, well, look, let's rummage around in our tool chest. Is there some nice techniques that we have? Things like trig identities or uh, algebra or substitution. Well, no trigonities really pop out here as saying, aha, this is really something that must be used. But substitution is very suggestive because we see the sign is inside of another sign. Yes, we saw the signs and they opened up our eyes. We saw the sign. <laughs> So let's think about substitution. So I'm going to, let's call this sine of x something. Because we are thinking we might do integration by parts later, we don't want to confuse ourselves, let's not use the symbol u. Um, and, and this is sort of one of the weaknesses of integration by parts is we're just so constantly using that udb notation, it throws us off when we don't use it. And so you, you have to be flexible. And at some point, you have to be willing to say, well, let me use other symbols. And just because I'm so used to integration by parts as u and v, I'm going to use a different symbol here. Uh, let's call this t. So let's say t is sine of x. And let's see what we can say. Well, if t is sine of x, the derivative of sine is cosine. OK, that's great. So we have plenty of cosine. But if anything, we have now too many. Hmm, let's think about what we can do. So we can think about this as 
there's a cosine cubed. One cosine I'm going to pull apart from the other. So there's still two cosines left. Then I have a sine of sine of x. And then I have a cosine of x that I came off of that cosine cubed and dx. So this part we're happy with. That would be our dt. The sine of x on the inside would be fine. That becomes sine of t. What about the cosine squared? What do we do with that? Well, the rule is you have to replace everything with an x with something with a t. So currently our t is sine of x. We have cosine squared. We start reeling through our trig identities and saying, is there any nice trig identity that connects cosine squared with something involving sine? Well, I think that they're a really nice one. Probably the most famous trig identity of them all. And that's the one that says, hey, you know, sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So, if we think about what that says, that says, hey, cosine squared is equal to 1 minus sine squared. Well, sine squared becomes t squared. So this part is 1 minus t squared. All right. Great. This is wonderful. Okay, so after doing our substitution, we are now to the following integral. Integral of 1 minus t squared times sine of t dt. And we're ready to proceed. So in some sense, we've done sort of the hard part. The hard part was, how do we get it to something that looks more like integration by parts problem? At this stage, we're like, hey, we've been doing these kinds of problems so the next couple of steps aren't going to surprise us. Uh, I, at least I hope not. So what do we see? Well, we see a polynomial. We see uh, a sine. We say, well, sine, integrate, differentiate, doesn't really matter. Polynomials, we like to differentiate because we like to push the power down until it goes so small, it goes away. So let's let this part be the part we differentiate, the polynomial. The sine t dt, that's the part we'll integrate. So we'll have du is minus 2t dt. And then the antiderivative of sine is minus cosine. So what do we get? Well, we get u times v. So that'll be a 1 minus t squared times a minus cosine t. Okay, all right. Well, it is what it is, right? Okay, and then, so, minus the integral of v du. So there's a minus 2t and a minus cosine t dt. Ah, this problem is very negative. Well, that's all right. We'll, we'll fix things up here. Uh, certainly, we see we have lots of negatives so boom boom okay well again round two we did one round we got it from a t squared to a t round two we'll knock the t down to a one perfect that will be great progress so we're gonna again similar as before u dv du derivative of 2t will be 2 dt. All right, how about v? If we take the antiderivative of cosine, we get sine. Okay, so what do we have? Now, one thing we can do is we can take this, see how we have a minus cosine t? We can think about putting that minus inside of here. And if we do that, it'll look a little bit nicer. It becomes t squared minus 1 times cosine of t. I might regret doing that later on. Hmm. I already regret doing that. Well, okay. You're probably wondering, why do you already re regret it? I'll just put the minus in front. 1 minus t squared times cosine t. 
Okay, then what we have the minus, and I'm going to use parentheses. So minus u times v. So 2t sine t minus the integral v du. 2 sine t dt. Okay, so we end up with minus 1 minus t squared cosine t and be careful with your signs here. That'll be a minus 2t sine t, okay, plus the integral of 2 times sine. Well, what's the integral of sine? The integral of sine is negative cosine. So when you work it out, that becomes minus 2 cosine plus c. So th this minus sign might be the trickiest one, right? There's a minus and a minus makes a plus. Integral of sine is a minus cosine. So, are we done? No, we're not. Why not? Well, we start in terms of x. We should end in terms of x. So we'll go back and replace everything in terms of x. Well, notice 1 minus t squared. What is that? Cosine squared of x. Okay, so minus cosine squared of x, and then we have cosine of sine of x, right? Then minus 2, and then t is sine of x, and then times sine of sine x. Then minus 2 cosine of sine x plus c. Exactly what we would have thought. Well, maybe not exactly what we would have thought, but it, it is the answer. We got there. We just had to be a little patient. And uh, it's kind of a fun problem. There's sort of a, oh, hey, first off, you have to make a substitution, do a little bit of your trig identities to make it work out, and say, oh, okay, integration by parts twice, and you get back. The problem initially, it looks crazy, almost impossible. But if we don't panic, and we just remember our basic mantra, try to make things a little bit simpler. And if you keep doing that, simpler and simpler and simpler, eventually it becomes so simple, you can actually do it. And we get our answer. What a great way to finish. And uh, I had fun. I hope you had fun too. And keep practicing, because we're going to have some more fun problems coming up in the near future. All right. Take care.